Hello students, I am Dr. Nazif Mahabub, lecturer of the anatomy department of Dr. Sayyidullah Medical College. Today we are going to teach on the topic of clinical anatomy, which is item number 15 of the head and neck cut. So the first question we will know that is, why the cut injury in the scalp causes profuse bleeding? We know that scalp is a layer which called scalp consists of five layers and the bleeding in the scalp is profuse. The main reason is that the area of the scalp is very rich in blood supply. Okay, there are many tiny arteries and veins which serve the individual muscles and skins of the scalp area. So as there is a dense network of the arterial supply and or dense network of the vessels, so if there is a um, cut in the scalp, this dense network of connective tissues surrounds the vessels they tend to hold the cut vessels open. As this result, there is the occurrence of the profuse bleeding. Dear students, now I am going to tell you about the black eye. Okay, so what is black eye? When there is an injury in the scalp or there is an injury in the forehead, we can see that the, the round shape, there is a round shape blackening just beside the eye. So why, this is called the black eye, so why this black eye actually occurs? We know that the occipital bellies of the, for, sorry, we know that the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscles has no bony attachment and this frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle is connected with the root of the nose and the upper eyelid. Now if there is any injury in the skull or in the forehead, blood then is connected is collected in the subaponeurotic areolar tissue and after it is collected in the subaponeurotic areolar tissue it slowly drools down the upper eyelid now when the blood is drooling down the upper eyelid it causes the accumulation in all the area in beside the eye so this results in a condition where, where the eyelids are black in color so this condition is called the black eye. Now another question can be that why black eye occurs as a consequence of the skull injury. Right. So I have to remember that when the skull injury occurs, the collection of blood occurs in the layer of the loose connective tissue. Right. And this collection of blood in the loose connective tissue may extend anteriorly into the root of the nose and then into the eyelids as you I have already told you that there is no bony attachment of the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle so as the blood uh, is collected into the root of the nose and then into the eyelids and just beside the eyes the condition of the black eye may occur now students we will know that which layer of the scalp is dangerous and why it is called dangerous we know that the fourth layer of the skull is known as the loose areolar tissue. Now, the layer of the subaponeurotic areolar tissue or this loose areolar tissue, this tissue, this layer is called the dangerous area or the dangerous layer of the skull. This is because in this layer, emissary veins are opened. Due to the opening of the emissary veins, the infection may transmit from the scalp to the intracranial venous sinus okay and this may produce thrombosis and ultimately it can cause to death that is why the fourth layer of the skull which is the loose areolar tissue is called the dangerous layer of the skull which is the dangerous area of the face the upper lip and the lower part of the nose like this lower part of the nose and the upper lip this area is called the dangerous area of the face this is called the dangerous area of the face because from this area infection can spread in a retrograde direction okay and due to the spread of infection this can result in thrombosis of the cavernous sinus when thrombosis of the cavernous sinus occur the facial vein with the cavernous sinus is connected so the infection spreads out in all these areas that's why the, this is called the dangerous area of the face drooping of the lower eyelid will occur and 
eyes cannot be closed, upward and outward rotation of the eyeball during an attempt to close the eye. This is called the Bell's phenomenon. During chewing, food accumulates between the teeth and the cheek, and the articulation of the lip will be affected, and also the production of the speech will be difficult. What is Bell's palsy? The lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve, uh, to be specific in the facial canal, can result from many idiopathic causes. If there is lower motor neuron lesion in the facial nerve, it results in the development of the characteristic symptom and signs in the face, which are together is called the Bell's palsy. There are some specific characters in this Bell's palsy. They are that both upper and the lower lip of the ipsilateral side that is on the one side will be paralyzed then the face becomes when this is paralyzed in the ipsilateral size the face becomes asymmetric and it is distorted and it is drawn up to the normal side you see this is drawn up to the normal side and the affected side in the area which is affected that is motionless there is no motion and if the person tries to smile, then it draws the mouth up to the normal side. This is the features of the Bell's palsy. Now, what is parotitis or mumps? Okay, so parotitis means the inflammation of the parotid gland. This condition of the parotitis, that is the mumps, is very painful. This is because the acute inflammation of the parotid glands okay is extremely painful as a result of stretching of the capsule and stimulation of the greater auricular nerve now this pain usually increases at the time of eating any meal when the gustatory stimulus to the gland results in further target within the capsule now mumps is actually an infectious disease of the salivary gland the salivary gland is usually the parotid gland. Now this is uh, caused by virus. What is goiter? Any enlargement of the thyroid gland is called goiter. What are the symptoms of goiter? Their weight loss, heat intolerance, palpitation, tremor, increased sweating, and there might be chronic diarrhea. So what are the signs of this goiter? The hands will be warm and sweaty, there will be a tachycardia, there might be exothalamus and pre-tibial mixing. Thank you. Now we will learn about cerebellar lesion. Another name of the cerebellar lesion is cerebellar syndrome. Cerebellar lesion is actually a bunch of signs and symptoms which altogether constitute as cerebellar syndrome. These characteristics can be featured as muscular hypotonia, intention tremor, ataxia or steady gait, then scanning of speech, dysdocokinesia, and mischeckness. What is tongue tie? Tongue tie is a congenital anomaly of the tongue in which the tongue is not free from the floor of the mouth. The main reason behind this is the shortening of the frenulum linguae. Now, as the frenulum linguae is shortened, so the tongue is attached to the floor of the mouth. The tongue tie causes disturbance of the speech. The most common form of the anicoglossia, the frenulum extends to the tip of the tongue. What is thyroglossal cyst? Thyroglossal cyst is actually a remnant or a cystic remnant of thyroglossal duct. It can lie anywhere in the migratory pathway of the thyroid gland, but there is a significance. It may always be near to the midline of the neck. What is the clinical importance of thyroglossal cyst? When the cyst enlarges, it may be prone to infection and it may cause various problems in our body.
So it will be wise to remove the thyroglossal cyst by surgical procedure. Now where is the location of the thyroglossal cyst? In nearly half of the case, the thyroglossal cyst is below the body of the hyoid bone. But they also may be found in the base of the tongue or they can also lie close to the thyroid cartilage. Now what is adenoid? Excessive hypertrophy of the lymphoid tissue when that is associated with infection, it causes enlargement of the, para, of the pharyngeal tonsil. When enlargement of the pharyngeal tonsil occurs, it is called the adenoid. Now what happens when adenoid occurs? The excessive enlargement of the pharyngeal tonsil actually blocks the posterior nasal opening. When the posterior nasal opening is blocked, the patient snores loudly and he tries to breathe through the open mouth. What is tonsillitis? Tonsillitis is the inflammation of the tonsils. Now, um, what are the symptoms of the tonsillitis? Right. The most common signs and symptoms would include red swollen tonsils, white or yellow coating or patches on the tonsil, sore throat, difficulty in swallowing or painful swallowing, fever, enlarged tender gland, stiff neck and headache. Now tonsillitis is more common in young children. What is the cause of this tonsillitis or what is the complication of the tonsillitis? The cause of the tonsillitis is mostly common via virus but also can be bacterial infections. The main bacteria that is causing the tonsillitis is Streptococcus pyogens. What will be the complication of tonsillitis? That will be difficulty in breathing, disrupted bleeding during sleep, infection that spreads deep into the surrounding tissue and also infection can result in collection of pus. What is sinusitis? Sinusitis means inflammation of the sinus. Now sinusitis is more common in the maxillary sinus and we know it as maxillary sinusitis. Sinusitis is common in maxillary air sinus because the drainage of the maxillary air sinus is difficult. That is because its ostium lies at a higher level than its floor. Another reason is that the cilia in the three lining mucosa are destroyed by the chronic infection. In recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, there is hoarseness of voice. Now, what is the reason? When the recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured at one side, then the opposite vocal cord compensates for it. So the person can still talk, that means the phonation is still possible, but there is hoarseness of the voice. What is otitis media? Otitis media is the acute infection of the middle ear. When otitis media occurs, bulging and redness of the tympanic membrane occurs. Organism can enter into the middle ear cavity by ascending through the auditory tube from the nasal part of the pharynx. Otitis media is of two types that is ASOM that is acute suppurative otitis media and CSOM chronic suppurative otitis media. The CSOM is more common in children. Now why is the CSOM more common in children? That is because it is shorter in length and it is more horizontal in direction. 